Hello, everyone. Um, depending on where you're joining us from today, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. We're happy to have participants from all around the globe joining us today for today's webinar, Comparing Measurement Techniques, TEM, DLS, and AFM, presented by Dr. Rob McCuskey. My name is Jared Lepkowski, and I'm the International Sales Manager for the DeLong Instruments Low Voltage Electron Microscopes. I'm joining you today from our North American offices in Montreal, Canada. The Long Instruments is proud to be sponsoring this webinar today, and we hope that you'll find it informative. Before we get going, I'll give an incredibly brief introduction to our company, DeLong Instruments. We're named for the late Professor Armin DeLong, a leader in the field of electron optics, founded in 1962 and headquartered in Brno, Czech Republic. We've since built a long history and strong reputation for developing and producing electron optical components, along with benchtop and compact transmission low voltage electron microscopes, namely the benchtop LVEM5 and the compact LVEM25. And now without any further ado, I'll pass over control to our presenter, Dr. Rob, McC Rob McCuspey. Well, thanks, Jared. Really appreciate the opportunity to present today and really appreciate everyone taking the time to join us here today. Um, just as a, a way of introduction, I'm, I'm really passionate about this topic of measurements, um, and especially at the nanoscale. I've got over 15 years of experience as a scientist in everything from academia, national labs, uh, corporations, and startups. Um, I've been lucky enough to publish um, several papers that have uh, been cited in the literature some number of times, so um, very excited about that. Um, but really, my, my goal with everything that I've done in my career, my life, is to make the world a better place through education, health, and the environment. And so this is a really great opportunity to help do that today. Um, I've also engaged in some leadership coaching at the intersection of science and business. Um, and so there will be a little bit of that flavor as we talk about the science here today. Um, I've, I've worked everywhere from uh, the Air Force Research Labs as a postdoctoral fellow after getting my PhD in nanotechnology and materials chemistry from the City University of New York. Um, I worked at the National Institute of Standards and Technology and made the, led the team that made the silver nanoparticle reference materials there. Uh, I got to be the first faculty and on the startup team at Florida Polytechnic University, the 12th uh, state university in the Florida system, and helped build their uh, nanotechnology and multifunctional materials curriculum. Uh, and so I've also been able to work in industry with a variety of companies from dietary supplements to uh, folio water that makes uh, point of use water filters um, to a company called NanoSafe uh, that performs regulatory and testing services, um, as well as my consulting. So really excited to bring this um, diverse set of experiences and going to try to present um, from that mindset. So the outline for today is to cover just kind of a broad overview of the importance of measurements, and then look at the specific topics um, outlined in the title, transmission electron microscopy, or TEM as I'll affectionately refer to it during this talk, low voltage electron microscopy, or LVEM as I affectionately refer to it, uh, dynamic light scattering, or DLS, and atomic force microscopy, or AFM. And so to kind of bring it all home and synthesize these foundations, we'll run through a quick uh, comparison of the techniques at the end and try to help go through a selection primer to see what are the, the best tool or tools for a given uh, research challenge and question that you might be looking to answer at any given point in time. And so just uh, as a point of um, curiosity and a way to keep this presentation a little bit more interactive is uh, we'll do a couple of poll questions throughout. And the first one I'd like to kick off with is just to understand which of these instrumental techniques that you currently or routinely use in your laboratory or research. And so uh, let's see. I don't know, Jared, if you're able to open the poll there. Yeah, we got the poll up now. Uh, we'll take answers for uh, about 20 seconds or so until um, we have the majority of participants, and then we'll close the, close the results. Great. So we've got about uh, half of the participants voted already. And I, I count myself fortunate to have been able to check off all of these boxes in my career. So. All right, so we'll close the poll now. 
and I will share the results. Wonderful. Okay, so it looks like TEM is the uh, leading technique. Um, LVEM is uh, trailing behind by AFM and DLS also. Um, so, and a lot of folks maybe uh, haven't had the opportunity to use um, every technique. So um, this is great. This helps me understand the background of where everybody's coming from in the audience today. And uh, hopefully this will enable um, folks to use these tools more effectively as they have opportunities. Wonderful. Okay. Um, just also as a, as a point of um, offering, there's a lot of resources available um, at lv-em.com um, focused on LVEM, of course, uh, with different user profiles, but also a, a great white paper that was really the inspiration for today's webinar and a variety of other technical white papers on different techniques um, and sample prep and different applications. So there's a, a host of additional information that's available out there as well that's uh, available for free. So let's dive right into the importance of measurements. Um, you know, it, it may feel a little bit like stating the obvious, but I always like to start at that place. You know, as we think about the scientific method and how we go from asking a question to developing a hypothesis, designing an experiment, making observations, analyzing the data, drawing conclusions, and then repeating again, asking a new question. You know, the, the aspect that really underpins making observations and the ability to collect data that you can then analyze, um, and really it should also influence how you design your experiments, is thinking about what are the measurements that are possible to be made and what do those measurements tell me? Um, how you know, how do those observations help inform the questions that I'm asking? And so to me, measurements are really one of the most critical parts of the scientific method and process. You know, obviously when we think about uh, measuring objects at the nanoscale, um, you know, length scales less than hundred nanometers, there's a lot of uh, tools that are out there. Obviously, the techniques we're going to talk about today include AFM, DLS, TEM, and LVEM with some uh, photographic examples of some of these instruments in their various installations. Um, and as we think about using any of the tools that are out there, uh, it's always good to think about what are the different standards that are available to help support making high quality measurements that are going to facilitate the comparison of results from one lab to another um, or in the peer-reviewed literature. And so there are kind of two classes of standards. There's the documentary standards or method standards, and these are more like a written protocol. Uh, you think of organizations like ASTM or ISO, many others write out these written documentary consensus standards. Um, I've illustrated some examples for uh, TEM just to show that there's a wealth of standards out there, oftentimes very specific for certain applications or experimental designs, um, maybe inspired by certain industry use cases. Um, but these documents help guide for a repeatable, consistent process. Um, the other aspect to consider is that there are reference materials or artifact standards, and these are the physical objects that you can use to calibrate an instrument uh, or verify that it is within calibration. Um, you know, having worked at NIST, I'm very familiar with a lot of their nanoscale reference materials, and so there's a, a wide variety of these materials. Um, without walking through all the details of what are out there, they're very useful for quality control, um, performing, validation of processes, uh, validation of procedures, confirming that you have trained laboratory personnel and that they're performing operations uh, correctly, um, and facilitating intercomparison of results that I had mentioned. Um, and, and it can also help with the traceability of your measurements as well. Um, and it's always good for when you're doing method development to convince yourself that it is working as intended. And without walking through all the details of these various reference materials, 
Um, I just want to highlight that the techniques we're talking about today, including AFM, TEM, and DLS, are very commonly found on the certificate of analysis for these reference material artifacts. And so um, these are uh, kind of techniques that are widely recognized and widely used as uh, very important approaches. So, and also these are uh, examples of artifact standards that you could use in your own research. So let's move on to our first topic of transmission electron microscopy. So the, a brief bit of history about this technique. Uh, it was first um, built by Ernst Ruska and Max Knoll in 1931. Um, and then uh, the Siemens Corporation released the first commercial electron microscope in 1938. Um, and interestingly, this Nobel Prize uh, winning invention uh, didn't win the Nobel Prize until over 50 years later, 1986. Um, it has played a key role. Um, it is considered the gold standard measurement technique in the nanotechnology field. Um, nanotechnology, of course, is the study of materials that have new properties emerging as a function of length scales between one and 100 nanometers, according to the US National Nanotechnology Initiative's definition. And so this gold standard technique, uh, it's required for uh, regulatory bodies when they're reviewing submissions, when they ask for characterization of the size of nanomaterials. And for example, in the European Union, they require two methods of size measurement for any nanomaterial that they are reviewing. And transmission electron microscopy is required. And then you can choose the second technique uh, based on your application. And so it really provides um, a lot of confidence. And I really, uh, I like the phrase that seeing is believing, you know, or, or a picture is worth a thousand words. When you can see the photographic evidence um, from a TEM image or, or even an LVEM image, you can really begin to get a good sense um, from a visual perspective of the size and shape and nature of the structures um, in, in the sample under analysis. So the TEM is uh, typically a several feet tall, maybe seven or eight feet tall, um, typically has its own dedicated room with uh, infrastructure supporting it. And uh, just at a high level for its construction, it, it has an electron gun that creates an electron beam. So you could think of that as a light source. And then it goes through some apertures and lenses to focus the beam onto the sample. And then that electron beam will pass through the sample. Um, thus, the transmission um, aspect of the electron microscopy. And then there'll be some additional lenses and apertures to focus uh, the signal that has been passing through the sample and focus it on to either a phosphor screen if somebody is looking at uh, the objects in the microscope itself, or it will pass it to a, a film or a CCD detector for digital imaging and uh, allow people to get those digital images directly on the instrument. Um, oftentimes, well, actually all times, you have to have the beam path under a extremely high vacuum um, so that the beam is able to um, go from its source all the way to the, through to the detector uh, without being scattered by um, the atmosphere. And so um, it requires high vacuum systems. Um, these um, electromagnetic lenses often require water chillers. And so there's a lot of infrastructure that goes into these systems. Looking at the uh, theory of why we're able to see these small structures with an electron microscope that we cannot with a light microscope, um, if we think about the theoretical maximum resolution of a light microscope, it's roughly uh, half the wavelength. And so um, when we think about um, how could we um, achieve a, a shorter wavelength of light, and we think about the de Broglie principle that electrons behave both as waves and particles, and if we can change the wavelength of a beam of electrons by changing the kinetic energy of those particles, uh, we can see that by using um, a greater energy, we can get a shorter wavelength. And so uh, without walking through all of those um, equations, it functionally 
equates to uh, very short wavelengths. So when we think about the visible wavelength uh, being 400 nanometers at the lower end um, and roughly uh, 5,000 uh, volt accelerating voltage for these different filaments gives you a wavelength on the order of 0.017 nanometers. So much, much smaller. Allows you to be able to begin to image um, single nanometer structures. And even at the higher accelerating voltages, you can begin to measure, in some cases, atomic resolutions of structures. And so by applying a, a high current, or excuse me, a high voltage to the either tungsten filament or uh, a lanthanum hexaboride single crystal or a lab six crystal, you can get these. Uh, beams of electrons at the shorter wavelengths um, and allow the imaging to take place of these smaller structures. Uh, to provide some uh, examples of what these photos look like in the, in the traditional accelerating voltage ranges of around 80 to 100 kV, um, you get typically routine imaging of very small uh, nanostructures. Um, here's an example of a silver nanoparticle reference material from this. Um, as I mentioned, you can get to atomic lattice spacing at the higher accelerating voltages, say 200 or 300 kV. Um, and you can begin to actually see uh, interesting material properties at these high ranges. And at a lower accelerating voltage of, say, uh, 5 kV, um, we'll talk about this more in the next section, you begin to get enhanced contrast for carbon-based materials. Uh, while still getting excellent size resolution. And so here's a LVEM image of nanocellulose. And so this is where there's kind of a, a bridge in the uh, traditional TEM techniques to LVEM as it um, expands the capabilities of the TEM technique while still in some senses being its own novel innovation. I would like to point out that there's a lot of um, sample preparation techniques that are available, um, not just in the peer-reviewed literature, but also standard um, techniques such as those developed by the Nanotechnology Characterization Lab and NIST. Um, this, this one is uh, PCC7 for measuring the size of nanoparticles using TEM. And it highlights some of the challenges that you can encounter, such as uh, drop pinning or the coffee ring effect, um, where if you simply evaporate a drop um, onto a TEM grid, um, the nanoparticles in suspension can get um, pinned due to the surface energy at the edge of the droplets as it's evaporating. And so you can get some uh, artifact structures if you're not careful. And so you, there may be other sample preparation techniques such as floating a grid on a droplet, uh, casting a film, um, or even using uh, functionalized uh, grids depending on the nature of the um, sample that you're trying to uh, capture from the solution. Um, there's also approaches for biological samples. Um, there are uh, hydrogels and aerogels, which may require casting into polymers and microtoming in order to get thin sections that would still be supported on the grid. Um, and so there's a, a wealth of uh, sample preparation technique guidances out there for this. So uh, this is kind of a good segue to move on to the low voltage electron microscopy section. And as we transition, I'd like to open it up for another poll um, and just ask what people's uh, perspective of the best technique to provide the best contrast for imaging a low atomic number material might be. So we'll have the poll open for another 10 seconds or so for everyone to uh, have their opportunity to cast their vote. All right. All right, sounds good. So we got most people answering LVEM, and uh, that is indeed the, the correct answer as we'll go through in this section. So if you did not get it, no worries, we'll walk through that. So uh, the, the low voltage concept in transmission electron microscopy is really for two primary reasons. The first is to increase the image contrast of low atomic number materials, and we'll, we'll walk through the, 
explanation for that in a moment. And it's also to allow the use of permanent magnetic lenses instead of electromagnetic lenses. And this really allows the column to be miniaturized and allows the tabletop feature of a LVEM um, to be realized. And this enables the smaller footprint in the lab, the easier operation and maintenance, um, and ultimately the lower cost compared to traditional TEM installations. So thinking about this increased image contrast for uh, a lower accelerating voltage for low atomic number materials. Um, the image contrast is given by the different amount of uh, electrons interacting with the specimen. And so uh, the amount of electrons that are going to interact um, is, is driven by the atomic number of the specimen in a way that the number of interactions uh, will increase with a growing atomic number. Um, if, you, if you want to think of it in a, in a ballistic sense, you can think of it as just a larger atomic number has more protons and more neutrons. Therefore, there's a larger opportunity for the electron beam to interact with um, something instead of passing through the space in between those nuclei. And so the, the main reason why specimens for the standard 100 kV microscopy get stained by heavy metals um, is to get sufficient contrast. Uh, biological specimens or carbonaceous specimens will oftentimes have these heavy metal stains to increase the contrast. And so by using a, a lower energy, um, as you can see, the, the cross-section for the electron scattering is um, increasing as you go to a lower accelerating voltage. Um, it, is, it is possible to observe these low atomic number materials in their native state without additional staining or processing. And so uh, this, this cross-section quantity um, it gives you a sense of how both the increasing atomic number increases the contrast and the decreasing accelerating voltage. So um, here we have an example with some figures of a, a low voltage electron microscopy image uh, labeled figure two, and a traditional TEM labeled figure three with the um, staining technique applied to provide the enhanced visual contrast of the, uh, in this case, it's a Borrelia burgdorferi um, microorganism, and uh, looking at the structure of these under the EM. And so it, it provides an excellent example of how you can resolve some of these structures uh, without the need of additional processing. And so there's two commercially available uh, low voltage electron mic microscopes. Both are made by DeLong Instruments, the only manufacturer in the world of LVEM technology. The LVEM5 uh, was commercially introduced in 2003. As you can see, it's a benchtop uh, size. Um, this is considered an entry level system compared to the LVEM25 we'll talk about in a moment. The uh, 5 kV or the 5 represents the 5 kV accelerating voltage, which provides resolutions of 1.2 nanometers in the TEM mode, of about 4 nanometers in the scanning electron microscopy or SCM mode and about 2.5 nanometers in the STEM mode. And the most common applications are nanomaterials analysis and uh, in-lab electron microscopy. Um, I know uh, personally in my career, it is really useful um, to be able to be, when I'm synthesizing nanoparticles, to have a benchtop EM right there in the lab so that I can get uh, a quick analysis of the size distribution of my materials and just get that quick uh, confirmation that it is indeed what I set out to make uh, before using it in additional experiments without having to wait for time at a core TEM facility. The LVEM25 is the second product. Um, it is also a very compact TEM. Um, it's the most powerful LVEM that's available. It was introduced in 2014. And it has uh, two imaging modes of TEM with a 1.0 nanometer resolution at 25 kV. And it can achieve uh, 1.3 nanometer resolution in its STEM mode at 15 kV or a one nanometer resolution at 10 kV. And this provides excellent uh, analysis for carbon-based thin sections, um, 
and it's become widely used. Um, it's a growing application space at core facilities in hospital pathology labs. Um, there's a lot of um, excellent information that can be gained um, by having electron microscopy analysis of certain uh, biological pathology samples and having an instrument that can be installed in a hospital lab instead of a, a core facility somewhere else um, allows better patient care at a lower cost. So some of the practical advantages of LVEM can be summarized by the instrument being optimized for ease of use, having a low laboratory footprint. There are no special facilities that are required for LVEM. It has very low operating costs. And it provides three imaging modes in one microscope with TEM, SEM, and STEM. To provide some examples of the enhanced contrast in a couple of these uh, applications that I've been referring to, I'm going to first show the example of imaging kidney amyloids and uh, in, in the case of renal pathology. And so kidney amyloidosis arises from the amyloid proteins not breaking down in the human body. And as they get deposited, they uh, can become deposited in the kidneys, which can make it harder and harder to filter waste. And so um, this is a, uh, a disease state that um, doctors need to know about so they can pre prescribe the right course of treatment for patients. Um, under a traditional TEM, um, you know, you can begin to see some of these um, protein uh, aggregates and structures. But with a LVEM25, you are able to get much greater enhanced contrast of these structures, uh, allowing for a more rapid diagnosis. Another application of LVEM is in virology. Um, obviously, the study of viruses has gained increasing attention in uh, the last couple of years. And so um, the idea that the LVEM can allow sample analysis without requiring negative stains such as uranyl acetate, uh, so you don't need to handle radioactive heavy metals, um, is, is a very powerful feature. And you can either, you can also image, um, in addition to unstained, you can still image lightly stained materials um, but it allows you to look at cross sections of tissues that may contain viruses without requiring additional staining. And it allows for a microscope that uh, can be placed close to where it's needed. And so in this case, uh, we've got some comparisons of adenovirus samples that were imaged by a conventional TEM and by the LVEM25. So you can see that enhanced contrast of the materials by the LVEM25. And you can get excellent resolution of the capsid structures of an adenovirus. You can see the, um, the capsid proteins on the surface, and you can even begin to see some of the icosahedral shaped structures in some of the virus particles. And so a very powerful technique uh, for the field of virology. So as we move on to dynamic light scattering, i um, like to open up another poll question um, to see which of the techniques we're talking about today may be the best for measuring a suspension of colloidal particles while still in solution. All right, thank you for sharing those results, Jared. And so we have uh, most people answering with DLS, which as we will see, yes, is the best technique for measuring colloidal suspensions while they are still in solution. Okay. So as we dive into DLS, uh, just to give kind of a quick overview of the measurement science of this technique, uh, you typically will have a, a laser illuminating a colloidal suspension of particles in the liquid. Um, oftentimes it'll be in a quartz cuvette 
um, the scattered light from the laser will then um, be, or the light will be scattered by the particles in solution. The scattered light will then hit a photodetector. Uh, Rayleigh scattering is what's driving this phenomenon. And so the intensity of the scattered light will be proportional to the radius of the particles raised to the sixth power. So um, you will be able to measure um, the hydrodynamic diameter of these particles, which will include the core material, any uh, shell coatings, um, any solvent molecules associated with its Brownian motion. Um, you can also have probe style uh, DLS um, instruments, which are not shown here, um, that are able to make the measurement as well. And so as particles of different sizes at a certain temperature will be um, experiencing Brownian, Brownian motion, they'll be moving around with a, a random walk through the cuvette. And so they will pass in and out of the beam path of the laser. And so the intensity of the light that is scattered to the photodetector will change over time. And so the fluctuations will be much shorter for smaller particles and be much uh, longer for larger particles. And so this scattered light intensity over time is called the correlation function in the instrument. And the correlation function can then be use to yield a diffusion coefficient of the various particles. Um, oftentimes, there's a computational mathematical fit performed by the software to determine the distribution of particles with diffusion coefficients that would fit the data. And once you have these diffusion coefficients, you can use the Stokes-Einstein equation to determine the hydrodynamic radius or of an equivalent sphere for the particles that would produce that uh, correlation function. Knowing, of course, the temperature of Boltzmann's constant and the solution viscosity. So this allows um, the DLS approach to measure, again, um, the entire particle. So everything that's moving in that Brownian motion. So it'll be the core particle, any hydrated shell or coating molecules, and any associated solvent molecules. Um, there is a excellent review article uh, that came out in 2018 that highlights uh, a lot more details for those that are interested. And just to provide an illustration of, uh, of results that one might get or a typical data set that one might get, this is for a fairly uh, monodispersed size distribution of, um, in, in this case, um, some silver nanoparticles that were synthesized. Um, you can see the size distribution is uh, centered around maybe 40 nanometers, 30 or 40 nanometers there. And you can also notice there is a little bit of, uh, of a peak greater than 1,000 nanometers in size. And typically, this happens with DLS. And it's uh, oftentimes um, related to dust in the samples. Um, as, as mentioned, the particle size um, drives uh, the intensity of the scattering hitting the light scattering hitting the photodetector due to Rayleigh scattering. So the intensity is proportional to radius to the sixth power. So as you go from on the order of 10 to on the order of 1,000, um, you know, you're talking about going by uh, 10 to the 12th um, increase in intensity of light. So these dust particles that might be present can swamp the photodetector in terms of the signal. Uh, one of the analogies I've heard somebody use that I really like is it's like staring at the sun trying to see the stars behind it. Um, so you, you get to a place where it's very challenging to see the smaller particles. So a dust-free environment becomes the best sample preparation technique for high quality DLS measurements. And oftentimes using um, clean benches, particle-free benches, for your sample prep, using filtered compressed air to clean the cuvettes and the caps, using filtered solvents um, to remove any uh, potential filtered or any particles that may have been present in the solvents, um, keeping everything capped except when being used in the clean bench to transfer samples and prepare them. Um, keeping dust from getting in is one of the best ways to get a high quality DLS measurement. Okay, so let's transition to talking about atomic force microscopy. And let's uh, start this section with another poll question. 
uh, about which technique is the best for measuring the z height or the topography of a sample um, of the techniques that we're talking about today. Just waiting for the rest of the votes to come in. Give it another 10 seconds. And it looks like uh, almost everybody uh, has zeroed in on AFM as the best technique for measuring the topography of samples or the Z height. So well done. And uh, we'll dive right into some of the metrology of how these measurements are made. Um, a little bit of history about the AFM. It was invented by Rohr and Binnick. Uh, which won the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1986, uh, same year as the electron microscope. Uh, the, the principle of the measurement is that you take an atomically sharp tip at the end of a cantilever. This atomically sharp tip will interact with the sample and uh, it will measure the topography of the sample. There is typically a laser um, focused on the end of the cantilever um, that reflects to a photodetector. And so as the tip interacts with the sample, um, the position of the reflected laser light will change on the photodetector and the instrument can then detect um, the changes in topography in that way. Um, there's many modes. Uh, two of the original and most common modes are contact where the tip is in a constant contact with the surface. Um, you could imagine as if somebody were putting their hand on a wall and uh, kind of rastering back and forth, feeling for where a light switch might be positioned on that wall in a dark room and creating a mental map. It's a very similar concept to how the contact mode uh, takes the tip feeling across the surface, rastering back and forth to find what the surface looks like. There's also a intermittent contact mode, uh, very often called a tapping mode. And that is where the tip will oscillate and tap across the surface. And so this, um, instead of dragging a hand across the wall in the dark room, you might imagine somebody kind of just tapping gently across the surface to feel for where the light switch might be. And uh, you can also perform force curves and understand uh, some of the mechanical properties of samples. Um, we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about that today, um, but it is also another powerful feature of the AFM technique. As I mentioned, there's a lot of different modes uh, that you can uh, employ in AFM from the contact uh, to a non-contact mode. Um, there are lateral forces. Um, you can do the force distance curves as we were discussing. Um, you can begin to look at magnetic forces, electrostatic forces, conductivity. Um, you can even perform AFM in a uh, liquid mode um, where the sample is uh, in a solvent system, typically water. Um, so there's a variety of advanced techniques that can be applied in AFM. And so again, um, typically when you're making these topographic images, you will raster the tip back and forth um, across the sample. Um, it can often take uh, several minutes on older systems to go back and forth and create a full image across uh, the field of view. Um, but you, you have these uh, piezo motors that will move the tip up and down to track the um, topography of the sample so that you're not um, you know, dipping into it or etching it per se, but you're actually just kind of tracking and following the contours of the surface. There are practical limitations to AFM as, as powerful as it is. No AFM tip is truly atomically sharp. Um, typically there is a radius of curvature. Um, you can get single nanometers, but oftentimes it can be 10 nanometers or more, especially as a tip begins to get worn out during use. Um, it'll begin to get blunted or um, dulled. And so uh, on the top, we have an illustration of the consequence of this, which is what's called the tip broadening effect. 
And that is where um, this less than atomically sharp tip uh, begins to raise up as it goes across the surface when it meets an obstacle, say a, a nanoparticle deposited on the substrate. And so the um, instrument will map the X and Y dimensions to be broader um, with the red and the blue being reported by the instrument. And so while your Z measurement is still incredibly precise, um, your X and Y can oftentimes be uh, impacted in this way. A second limitation is that um, if you have very tall or steep features, um, such as step edges or high aspect ratio trenches in a surface, um, there is just an inherent angle um, to the tip. And so if these are very tall, uh, very tall on the you know, scale, of course, um, then the, in the X and Y direction, um, the tip can only go down at that angle that the um, tip is manufactured at. And so you can begin to get a V-like shape reported by the instrument instead of uh, its ability to measure the full narrow trench as, uh, as one would expect. So given these limitations and understanding that, um, one can still see the types of data that one can get. Uh, this is just an illustration of the difference between a, a sharp tip or a, a small radius of curvature and a dull tip on the right with uh, images B and D um, or a, a larger radius of curvature. You can see this tip broadening effect um, in, a, in a really exaggerated case. As I mentioned, um, you know, you can, during use, it can increase the radius of curvature. Uh, this is some uh, microscopy images of the tips after use. You can see that sometimes they will pick up debris from the samples, uh, both on the conical portion, um, sometimes and even at the end uh, of the atomically sharp region. Uh, there are sample prep uh, protocols out there for AFM. Uh, again, there's NIST NCL protocols. Um, oftentimes you will use an atomically smooth substrate um, to deposit nanoparticles before imaging. Um, again, you have to pay attention to those uh, coffee ring effects or the drop pinning effects. Um, but there are, again, various tricks and techniques such as electrostatic deposition or chemical deposition, depending on the nature of the materials. Um, and also considering um, how in biological samples, uh, a liquid mode imaging may work um, in order to provide a, a hydrated sample measurement. So now that we've had a foundation of these different techniques, I'd like to move into the comparison section and try to synthesize all of this into a selection primer. So this poll question uh, will be kind of an introduction for a case study here. Um, which of the techniques is best for measuring size distributions of a mixture of different sizes or shapes of nanoparticles? Um, and there may be more than one, although um, I don't know if you'll be able to pick more than one in this particular poll. Um, Pick, uh, pick your favorite if you feel there are multiple. Votes are still coming in. We'll uh, keep it open for another 10 seconds or so, and then we'll see the results. OK, so uh, looks like TEM and DLS were the winners for a different uh, sizes or shapes, the polydispersed samples uh, with LVEM and AFM trailing. Okay. Well, um, as uh, one of my professors in college who taught about the uh, Heisenberg uncertainty principle, whenever we'd ask him a question, his answer was, it depends. <laughs> and in this case, there's not one single answer. It depends on the uh, specifics that you're looking for. But in general, the, the best techniques would be TEM, LVEM, and AFM if you're looking for uh, different shapes of materials. Uh, 
again, because the dynamic light scattering is looking at an equivalent sphere diameter. Um, so the, the shape uh, variation would not be communicated in those results. Um, so it's important when you're picking these different techniques to think about the different measure ends. And so again, you've got a very precise XY dimension with TEM and LVEM that allows you to have that shape information. Um, and it's important to keep in mind that the samples are prepared in a dry condition um, and imaged under a vacuum conditions. And so with the DLS, it's, it's not able to get the shape, but it does give you the average uh, hydrodynamic diameter. And the advantage there is that it uh, is an aqueous suspension, so you don't have to worry about drying down a sample. With AFM, you can get shape information. You might have broadening in the XY dimension for varying degrees, but you'll get a very precise Z height dimension. Um, and it can be measured in the dry state um, as, as well as in an aqueous state. So thinking about kind of this handy comparison chart will allow you to kind of pick through what might be the best approach for your sample conditions that you're trying to do. Um, for TEM and LVEM, um, you can dry and drop cast or use thin sections and you have to be able to see the sample. Um, see through the sample. So it has to be thin enough for the beam to transmit or pass through. Um, it allows you to measure very well in X and Y. And for DLS, it allows you to measure in a liquid suspension and calculate the equivalent sphere diameter. And for AFM, it is, um, again, you're looking at dry or drop cast or thin section samples, and you're getting that topography or height measurement. So you can't really see through the sample, but you can get very precise height measurements. So um, oftentimes, um, when researchers have the luxury of, of time and access to all of these equipment options, they will look at um, oftentimes all of these, several or all of these approaches in order to get a more complete picture with these multiple orthogonal measurements. Um, this was reported in the peer-reviewed literature for the case of silver nanoparticles. Um, to put a little bit finer point on what it's actually measuring, if you Imagine that silver nanoparticles oftentimes have a coating or a shell on them that might be a polymer or a starch or a natural organic molecule. Um, in addition to that silver metal core, um, when you look at uh, TEM um, or LV, or, uh, TEM, excuse me, you are measuring typically just the metal core for the diameter um, and you're making the measurement on a number basis, which I'll come back to in a minute. Um, but the, the strength is that you then see the very small nanoparticles very clearly. Um, and the weakness becomes that you may miss infrequent structures. So if it's a, a one in a million large particle, uh, you may never see that on the TEM grid. Um, with the atomic force microscopy, you would get both the silver metal core and any uh, coating molecules that have dried down into a dehydrated, dehydrated state so you might expect the height to be a little bit uh, taller than what you might see on a traditional TEM. But if there's any shape asymmetry, um, if it's not a perfect sphere, but maybe a little bit more oblong, um, you might get a little bit shorter dimension in Z height than you might get in XY if there is that uh, disparity, non-uniformity um, from a break from perfect spherical symmetry. It's also a number basis for the measurement. And again, so it gives you that strength of seeing the very small nanoparticles and the infrequent structures. And so when you think about the number basis for the measurement, um, when you look at a size distribution, you're then typically reporting um, you know, so many particles, a certain number of particles for that size bin on the histogram. And so, by comparison, when you look at dynamic light scattering, um, what's often reported is the intensity of light hitting the photodetector in that bin for particles of that size. And so the measurement basis is uh, a volume squared or radius to the sixth power. So if you think about uh, a particle that is, say, 100 nanometers in size, and there's one in a million of those large particles, and everything else was 10 nanometers in size. 
the 999,999 small particles will provide the same intensity on the photo detector as that one particle that was 10 times larger at 100 nanometers. And so the intensity distribution would be 50-50 for that um, sample, whereas the number distribution, you might not even see the 100 nanometers. It's so small uh, when you scale the axes that way. So the strength of DLS then becomes looking and finding those infrequent larger nanoparticles. And so if the question of aggregation uh, becomes important, DLS is a good tool for detecting early signs of aggregation versus monodisperse small particles. Even though if you have a mixture of different sizes, um, it can become very challenging to see those small nanoparticles well in the mixtures. And in DLS, you're measuring also the, the silver shell, the coating molecules that are maybe fully extended if they're polymers because they're hydrated, and perhaps even some solvent molecules as well associated with the Brownian motion. So typically, you would expect the DLS size to be the largest that's reported um, compared to the four techniques in this chart. For LVEM, um, you're going to be able to measure both the silver metal and that uh, carbonaceous coating because of the enhanced contrast. And you're going to get that number basis and uh, be able to get the, again, the very small particles and the, uh, at the risk of missing those one in a million infrequent structures. So you can see uh, in the histograms at the lower case um, how the different size base histograms of similar samples would compare under pristine conditions or um, in a moderately hard reconstituted water by one of the EPA standards. And you can begin to see the different types of information that you get from a number-based uh, resolution in frame D, it really is pronounced compared to the DLS and the AFM data presented there. So to kind of summarize and wrap up um, this decision-making section, the TEM is great for images. It's great for uh, dimensions of dry samples, especially in X and Y. And it's great for biological sample imaging um, the LVEM provides enhanced contrast, especially for low atomic number materials, carbon-based materials. Uh, it has excellent operational ease. It is an affordable approach. Um, it has a benchtop option or a very low footprint lab option. comparisons of the techniques covered today. And I'd uh, like to take some time to open it up for questions. Thanks, Rob. Uh, appreciate the presentation. We do have a couple of questions that have come in. Um, if you can pull them up in the Q&A panel, there's two questions there that maybe you can address. Yes. Um, so yeah, so the first question I see is that the DLS size distribution looks almost symmetric, but it is on a log scale that implies the distribution is not Gaussian, should it be? Um, that is a great question. I don't know if it should be for that particular data set because I did not review um, for that particular sample what other techniques provided in terms of information. Um, oftentimes, you will see what looks like um, that shape to the size distribution in DLS results. Uh, and so it is, um, you know, something that oftentimes will show up, but sometimes you will see something that looks uh, a little bit with a, a little bit different skew factor in the shape of that size distribution. Um, I'd like to also take a moment while I'm on the topic of DLS size distributions to offer a finer point some studies in the peer-reviewed literature have shown that you need to have, um, if you have a multimodal size distribution, you need to have a factor of at least two or three difference in the diameters to be able to resolve the different peaks by DLS in a good way. If the 
two peaks are um, close to each other. Um, the software can oftentimes do some overlapping and you'll see what looks like a broad single size distribution instead of a finite multimodal distribution. So um, it's definitely a great question and something that should be paid attention to when you're looking at DLS measurements. So really appreciate that question. Um, I also see a question about, um, can you use the AFM method for imaging the fluid fluid interface, for example, at the interface of oil water or interface of an emulsion? How can we prepare samples and perform the test? And um, this would be a, a, a rather challenging experiment to make uh, a topography measurement for a fluid fluid interface. Um, you know, most of what I'm familiar with with people imaging emulsions, they're looking at what are the size of, say, the, the particles that are formed in an emulsion. And so they're perhaps looking at a way to deposit those particles onto a surface and then keeping it in a liquid environment so that they can, once those particles are immobilized on a support, still maintain their shape. Um, I've, I've seen and heard of people doing that with AFM, but as, as far as if you had like one film floated on top of another film, um, it, it could be challenging to image that type of an interface. Um, if, you're, if you're talking about two different layers, that could be rather challenging from what I understand. Um, but that's a, that's a really great question. Appreciate it. And let's see, I see some other questions. Uh, which of these instruments can be combined with elemental analysis? That's a great question. So uh, in my experience, um, typically what I will do is look at the techniques discussed today for characterizing the size of the particles, while I will look at techniques such as ICPMS or AAS or um, OES for uh, elemental analysis and chemical analysis. You may also look at things like um, XPS um, for surface chemical analysis. Um, you know, if you have a scanning electron microscope, you might be able to use um, energy dispersive spectroscopy or EDS. Um, if you're using transmission electron microscopy, there are additional detectors such as um, the EELS detectors or um, electron energy loss spectroscopy. And that would allow you to get elemental mapping on a TEM sample so that you could look at um, the, the energy loss of the electrons as they transmit through the sample will be dependent on the elements they were interacting with. And so the EELS detector allows you to determine which elements were located in which positions um, on the image and get some elemental mapping information. So um, those are very challenging um, experiments to perform. They require some expensive detectors, but it is possible to be uh, performed in that way. Um, but oftentimes people from practical perspectives and access to equipment will just take some size measurements and combine it with other chemical analysis um, and use that to infer the total picture. Um, and there's also opportunities to look at single nanoparticle ICPMS, which uh, really could be its own entire seminar where you look at measuring the chemical composition and the size distribution of particles at the same time. So we'd be happy to follow up about that offline. Really appreciate that question. Um, let's see, I have another question about uh, computational methods. What is my opinion about them? Do uh, you encourage to use them besides experimental techniques? Um, I'm, I'm always a fan of combining computational and experimental methods when it is possible to do so. Um, you know, th that can lead to the most elegant fundamental studies if you can actually get some computational modeling that reflects the experimental aspects that you're trying to interrogate. And if you can design, um, experiments that will validate the computational models that you're trying to do. Um, excuse me, this is something that is, I've found very challenging to do throughout my whole career to make it really interface nicely. But when you can achieve that, it provides some really elegant results and reports. 
And um, then if you've validated a computational method, you might be able to use it to better predict um, other um, experimental results and kind of guide where you might want to look. So um, it's, it's great. And um, I'm an experimentalist by training, so I just want to acknowledge that bias as well. Um, I'm an experimentalist at heart, so I'm always going to personally default to that approach, but really appreciate the question. Um, see another one here about uh, using a profilometer measuring Z height. Would I say that the AFM is better? Um, so I would say that uh, profilometers tend to have a larger radius of curvature on the stylus. Um, profilometers have a certain application space uh, that is useful. Um, AFM has a, a certain application space that's useful. It often depends on the size of the sample and the size of the features as to which of those two you might choose. Um, so I think that they both have the opportunity to provide good information. Um, you just have to be aware of the strengths and limitations of each. Um, let's see. I have a, we see the question here about uh, work on amorphous mesoporous silica alumina substrates for heterogeneous catalysis. Um, could I please talk if AFM would be useful in studying its surface features? I've already used um, SEM, but TEM did not get great results. So uh, with mesoporous uh, silica alumina substrates, um, Yes, I would think with TEM, you would have to have a, a thin section um, that would allow the beam to transmit through it. Um, I think um, SEM is a, a good choice. I think AFM could provide some good information. Um, again, keeping in mind about the topography of the surface and wanting to um, recognize if there are very high aspect ratio and steep pores um, the, the shape of the AFM cantilever may produce some artifacts. Um, and also just understanding if there's, uh, you know, hidden um, spaces underneath the overhanging surfaces that you may not see underneath those overhangs. Um, and if that's important, it's something you would want to consider. Um, and so electron microscopy where you could tilt samples may be more appropriate in that case. Um, but I think uh, AFM could provide some interesting information potentially. So it would definitely be worth um, you know, checking out a couple samples and do a feasibility study to see if it's appropriate for your samples. Okay. And uh... All right, Rob, I think we've reached our time uh, that we have allotted for the webinar. Thank you very much for uh, taking the time to present for us today. I hope everyone found it as informative as I did. Um, any questions that we haven't addressed, uh, we can try and address for a future webinar. Um, I'd like to thank you, Rob, for joining us and all the participants as well. I wanna let everyone know that they'll be presented with a short survey after they sign off. And if you could please take the time to complete it, it would be much appreciated and will help guide us for future webinars that we may uh, be offering as well. Uh, and for your reference, we'll be posting this webinar for everyone to review in the near future on the www.lv-em.com website. So again, thank you everyone for participating and thank you, Rob, for uh, taking the time to share with us. Thank you, Jared, and thank you everyone for participating. Really appreciate your time and attention and questions. Thank you so much.